Hello, my name is Nick Charles. I'm an engineer with Loomis and Associates. I'm going to take a few minutes today to talk to you about the Carson River Water Marketing Study that we're working on with the Carson Water Subconservancy District. So what is a water marketing study? Well, this project is funded through a grant from the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, and the purpose is to develop water marketing strategies that establish or expand water markets or water marketing activities between willing participants in compliance with state and federal laws. Really what it boils down to is this is a project looking at how we can take our water resources and more effectively or effectively manage those within the, water, the Carson River watershed. Now I wanna hi highlight um, a couple of points is it has to be between willing participants and anything we do has to be in compliance with state and federal laws. And that'll make more sense as we go through some later slides. So our strategy to complete this project really begins with understanding the watershed and trends that are happening in the watershed. What's going on with the Carson River and the water within the Carson watershed? Then we want to look at who are the water users and understand how and why they're using water. The next thing we want to look at is existing water marketing activities that are already occurring. There's actually quite a few activities that would be classified as water marketing um, activities. And then we want to look at what are other water marketing strategies that may be implemented in the future that may be feasible. So we want to look at those concepts. Well, let's start by looking at watershed trends and what's going on in the water system right now. Um, I want to highlight and emphasize that this is a very high level analysis that we're going to talk about. It's not a detailed deep dive into what's going on in the watershed. So let's jump into it. The first thing we want to look at is in-stream flows. There are four gauges along the Carson River that we're going to, we've spent most of our time looking at. There's a gauge on the West Fork at Woodford's, one on the East Fork near Gardnerville, one on the main fork of the river near Carson City, and another on the main fork near Fort Churchill. Now these um, gauges, we're only looking at data from 1940 to 2019. Before 1940, the data for these gauges was a little bit sporadic. From 1940 on, the data became very consistent. And so that's why we're only going back as far as 1940. Now I want to take and begin by looking at this graph right here. This is flows in the Carson River near Carson City. There's a couple things shown here. The orange line represents the annual average discharge. So this is the amount of flow going down the river on average throughout the year. Then the dots represent the peak discharge, the peak day discharge for each year in the uh, data set. Now, the first thing we wanna look at is if we look at 1980, roughly right here, to today, we can point out visually several locations that appear to be higher than anything from 1940 to 1979. Similarly, if we look at low, we can point out several long periods where flows stayed low that we don't see prior to 1980. So the way we can interpret this is just a visual interpretation of this slide is that there seems to be higher highs and lower lows occurring after 1980 than prior to 1980. There's more variability in the data. Now, we can observe this, but statistically we can look at this as well by looking at the standard deviation. Standard deviation is simply just a measurement of the variability in data. So as we progress through this data, the standard deviation is actually going up, which emphasizes or reinforces the concept that we just talked about, that the variable, the flows in the river are becoming more variable as time progresses. So that's one key point that I wanna make with this uh, slide. The second is looking at this trend line. We have this dotted line running through the data. This represents the trend of the data. Now, it's hard to see in this figure. If we were to blow this image up, you could see that that trend line is actually sloping downward, which means the trend is flows are decreasing in the river. So what that means is on average, 
there's less water coming down the river now than there was in 1940. How do we quantify that? Well, right here is how we quantify that. So on average, between 1940 and 2019, flows in the West Fork at Woodfords are down 8%. In the East Fork near Gardeville, 6.4%. Near Carson City, over 9% decrease in flow from 1940. And at the Fort Churchill gauge, 3.8% 3 decrease in flow. So let's kind of go back and highlight the two take home messages from the slides. One, flows are decreasing in each river, river segment. Um, those are statistically significant uh, decreases. And so we can say that flows are decreasing. The other thing is flows are becoming more variable. So we're seeing decreasing flows and the flows are becoming more sporadic. They're becoming higher and they're becoming lower um, as time progresses. So let's take a look at this and, and look at what may be causing this. So we're looking at climatic conditions in Carson City. So temperature and precipitation in particular. This top line represent, or is precipit temperature as measured in Carson City. And you can see we have the variability we would expect. Some years are a little warmer than other years. Some years are a little colder. But if you put a trend through that, that trend is actually going uphill. It's sloping upwards, which means temperatures are increasing. On average, temperatures are going up in Carson City. The opposite is true for precipitation. We can see the variability in the data. Some years are wetter than others. Some years are drier than others. But overall, this trend is sloping down, which means we're seeing a decrease on average in precipitation at Carson City. So what does this mean? Well, one of the things that we did with this data was we looked back and said, can we predict flow at the Carson City gauge using precipitation and temperature? And so to test that, we tried to predict historical flows. So we have actual flows and we can compare them against our prediction. So this chart, the orange shows the actual flows that are measured at the gauge. The blue shows predicted flows based upon temperature and precipitation. And you can see there's some discrepancy, but overall we show the same general patterns. So if actual, you know, if our predicted flow goes up, in a lot of cases, our actual flow goes up. If predicted or if Predicted flow goes down. We're generally seeing predicted flow go down in our um, predictions. So we feel like there we can predict flow with based upon temperature and precipitation. So if we look at that, what does that actually mean? Well, we have this line right here, this gray line. And if we predict flow into the future for 20 years, we're actually seeing a decrease in flow, which is consistent with the trend we're seeing on the previous slide where flows have been decreasing in the Carson River. So that's kind of looking at flow on an annual basis. Let's dig in just a little deeper and look at what happens on a monthly basis. Um, so this chart is showing us flow from average flow from 1940 to 1959, and average flow from 2000 to 2019. Now, if, let's focus on the 1940 to 1959 initially. We can see, as expected, flow stays pretty consistent through the winter and into the early, early spring, and then it starts to go up. We would expect that. Um, <clears throat> and then it goes up and peaks, and then comes back down in the summer, and then once fall hits in early winter, we start to see flows go back up. Let's compare that to average flows from 2000 to 2019. Well, flows are going up faster, which means we're seeing runoff and snow melt occur earlier than historically. The interesting thing though is once we hit April, May, these lines are very, very similar all the way to October. And then we don't see the same level of increase in recent years in the fall period. So we're seeing changes in the way flow is occurring in the river 
as a percent of average flow. Snow melt runoff is coming earlier in the year, and then we're not seeing quite the increase in the fall. So those are the some, some messages that we need to understand with this uh, information. Now for comparison purposes, we have this dotted line right here. This is flow at Truckee, or the Truckee River at Reno. Um, we don't have the peaks that we have on the Carson River, and we never really go below 50%. Now the big difference here is the Truckee River has a lot of storage, whereas the Carson River doesn't. And you can see the, the advantage of that storage on the watershed is we're taking away the high highs, but we're taking away the low lows. So the flows in the river are becoming much more consistent. So with that storage, we can mitigate some of these changes in the river system. So what does this mean? So for water users along the Carson River, these trends are troubling. Um, the result is an amplification of the feast or famine condition that already exists for the Carson River with the average flow slowly decreasing and flow patterns slowly changing. If this trend continues, flows will continue to become more extreme, less reliable, and continue to decline. The lack of significant storage in the upper watershed prevents any stabilization or mitigation of these extremes. What it boils down to is the Carson River is extremely dynamic. It's changing. It's not static. It's not staying the same. We're seeing changes in seasonal flows. We're seeing decreases on average in the flow in the river. We're seeing changes in precipitation and temperature. So let's jump now into water users. Who's using our water? So first thing is let's look at groundwater. Um, this is groundwater pumpage from the Nevada Division of Water Resources averaged between 2013 and 2017. And you can see the Carson Valley, the hydrographic basin representing the Carson Valley is the highest amount of pumpage. In Eagle Valley and Churchill Valley, they all have less pumpage. Um, and we represent different users, so irrigation, domestic, municipal users, and then other users. We also show on this graph perennial yield. Now this is an estimate on how much water is coming back into the system due to, let's say, precipitation. Um, you can see these, this estimate is from the Nevada Division of Water Resources. There's other estimates. The USGS has some estimates, but we're sticking with the Division of Water Resources right now because they are the, um, the re regulatory agency for water pumpage in the state of Nevada. Um, but you can see there appears to be excess water in the Carson Valley. Well, let's jump over here to the cumulative. How does the whole system look? Well, it appears that there's possibly excess water in the all of the Carson River watershed. Now, we have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt because you know there's other issues that we have to look at. Can we get the water out of the ground? And, and after that, can we actually use the water? There's places in the watershed where we have high nitrates or high total dissolved solids or high arsenic, making that water unusable without treatment for municipal purposes. So now let's jump into municipal water users. Um, in the water system, there are 84 regulated water systems. 32 of those are community water systems. That's really what we're gonna focus on. Those are our houses, those are our businesses. Um, they serve over 44,000 connections um, using an approximate 26,460 acre feet of water per year. Now, there's also 13 non-transient, non-community systems. These are things where, such as a school, where we're seeing the same people in that, um, using that water day after day, but they don't live there. So it's non-transient, but it's not a community water system. Then we have 39 transient non-community systems. These are systems where we see a high turnover of people and generally don't see the same people day after day using the system. These are things such as campgrounds um, that you'd go visit um, in the forest. Now, looking at this, this is water use amongst a handful of the 32 community water systems, representing a majority of the community water systems. Most of these water systems get their water from groundwater. 
but some of them um, also use surface water. Douglas County, Carson City, Lyon County, and Story County all use some or all of their water comes from surface water. Now we want to look at, we, we just looked at how much water we currently use from a municipal water system. Let's look at what we need in the future. Um, I want to highlight that this is log, uh, log scale. Um, so each unit between the lines is a little different than the one before it. But jumping out here to the total of all of these water systems, right now in 2020, we're estimating about 26,650 acre feet of water being used. Um, in 2030, we're estimating 27,760 acre feet of water. And then in 2040, 20 years from now, we're going to need about 28,000 acre feet of water. So if you compare 2020 to 2040, we need approximately 1,400 um, additional acre feet of water to meet municipal demand in the watershed. So what does all that mean? Let's, let's put this in perspective. The first thing I want to highlight is this number right down here. It's estimated that agriculture uses approximately 95% of the surface water in the Carson River. That leaves 5% for other uses, 5% plus groundwater. So looking at what actually is running down the river, um, average is 292,000 acre feet of water. But in those low years, there's not very much water in the river. And in high years, there's, there's a lot of extra, going back to that um, high variability in the river. Um, we're seeing that. Um, so the question is really, how do we efficiently manage this so the most people can utilize the water that's available? So let's talk about water marketing and, and management. So what's currently going on? What are the current options available within the watershed for water marketing? Well, let's start off with the Alpine Decree and Water Rights Law. Law, the existing laws and decree allow for changes in points of diversion, places of use, manners of use of water rights. So water can be essentially moved around. Um, that provides a lot of flexibility on when, how, and where we use that water. Now, I need to emphasize that this is not a, an easy process. There's a lot of work that it takes. It can take quite a while to ch make these changes, but it is possible. Um, the other thing that's going on that's pretty extensive is municipal water systems uh, regionalization. Um, there's numerous water systems that are now interconnected. There's a pipeline from Minden to Carson City that allows Minden water to be used by Douglas County, Indian Hills, and Carson City. There's uh, planning in um, work right now to plan and prepare to build a pipeline from Dayton all the way out to Stagecoach. There's inner ties between water systems. So we're, the municipal water systems are working together to try to more effectively use the resources that we have. Um, water reuse and engineered recharge. Wastewater effluent is a, is a huge um, impact to the Carson watershed. Um, there are lots of water, uh, wastewater systems that discharge into the watershed. Now, they're not discharging into the river, but they're using that water for beneficial use in the watershed. For example, a lot of treated wastewater is used for agriculture. In addition, um, a lot of water is imported in, a lot of treated wastewater is imported into the water system from the Tahoe Basin, South Tahoe PUD, Douglas County Lake Tahoe Sewer Authority, Incline Village General Improvement District, all take their treated wastewater and pump it up over the mountain into the Carson watershed for disposal um, in the watershed. So those are water imports. Other water imports are also um, exist in the watershed. Truckee Canal, Marlette Hobart Water System, they're importing water from outside of the Carson watershed into the Carson watershed. So those were existing water marketing opportunities. What are some future water op options? Well, 
let's begin with this chart right here. These two lines we've already looked at in a little different scale, but this is um, how our flows look throughout the year. And we talked a little bit about how they've changed from 1940, the average early in our data set to the average in our later data set. Well, what I want to show here is this is flow in 2017, and it's significantly higher than average. There was a lot of water come down the, the Carson River in 2017, 900% of average at, at the peak. So the question is, are there opportunities in years like 2017 where we can take that excess water and divert some of it out of the river or store some of it so that we can use it later? So we've looked at a couple of options to do that. One is, can we increase storage capacity in reservoirs? Can we increase Lahont Reservoir? Can we increase the size of it? Can we increase the capacity of Mud Lake? Or could we construct a new off-stream reservoir somewhere? The next idea is aquifer storage. So instead of storing this excess water in an existing or a new surface storage site, can we take that water and divert it to an infiltration basin or injection wells so that it goes into the groundwater so we can pump it out of the groundwater aquifer at a later date? Those are a couple of options or concepts that we're currently investigating. Now, kind of highlight what, we, what I mentioned earlier is any feasible option must be consistent with the Alpine Decree and existing water law. So we have to keep that in mind as we review these concepts. So what's next? Where do we go from here? Well, the first thing is to continue developing these water marketing concepts. And once we've got those developed, we need to evaluate how each of these concepts will operate. You know, first thing is physical operation. How does that work? How do we get raw water out of the river? Do we have to pump it? Can, we, can, we, can it flow by gravity in existing canals? How do we physically make it work? The next thing is how do we make it work from a jurisdictional and regulatory standpoint? How does it work in relationship to the Alpine Decree and existing water laws? And then once we go through those evaluations, we can say, okay, these are the feasible options. We can actually, this actually works and it works in accordance with the Alpine Decree. So we need to identify those feasible options so that we can present those and those could be uh, concepts that could be further developed in the future if um, they're determined to make sense. So with that, um, I appreciate your time and I thanks for letting me share some of these thoughts with you.